Hey, man. Hey, how's it going? It's going good. How's it going with you? I'm doing very good. Richard T. Bear. T. Bear. How's it going in the land of uh, Blues Rock? It's going really good. It's like that. The way of the world has been released for a few months now. And it's like, uh, or how, how long has it been released? Like in, in March? Yeah, about a, yeah, well, and very end of March. So it's it's about a month, month and a half, maybe. Yeah. How's that album doing? Because I mean, it's got um, good sound quality and it should be um, doing pretty good on blues charts. It's it's doing really well. The, the the single "A Change Would Do Me Good" went to number one in the Hit 100 over in Europe, and um, it's getting like great reviews from the from the critics. Great critical reviews, and uh, people are loving it. It's it's really good. It sounds good. It it's it's really a kind of an, awa uh, an oasis for your ears in many ways. And it's like when you when you do hear something like that that sounds good, it's good for radio, and yeah. good for radio it's good for everything else. It sound it actually sounds really good on the radio, yeah. And with your career um, as Richard T. Barrett, you had singles on the radio. I mean, you had Canadian charting stuff as well back in the day. I, I have some of your forty fives actually. <laughs> Yeah, I go back so old. I'm so old, and I go back so far that my first album came out on vinyl and eight tracks. I mean, if you can believe that. Um, you know, then later vinyl and cassettes, then later vinyl and, and CD. But, yeah. And, and, uh, and, and because you, where are you located right now? In Nova Scotia, Canada. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, I love that area, by the way. I mean, I, uh, I once had a honeymoon up that way. So okay. I, um, I loved it. Um, uh, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island. Um, I spent a lot of time, you know, I'm a fishing musician. Okay. I'm, I'm a jerk on one end of the line waiting for a jerk on the other end. You know, that's, that's kind of, kind of the thing, but I, I love, I love Canadian, uh, music. Um, you know, my my favorite band growing up, believe it or not, and I'm not pandering to you, was the Guess Who. Okay. And, uh, you know, I loved the Guess Who. And when I got signed to my first record deal, they said, who do you want to produce you? And I said, I want the guy that produces the Guess Who, Jack Richardson. And so they got me Jack. He also did Night Moves with Bob Seger. And, uh, you know, I used to make records in Toronto. A lot, a lot of records over at Nimbus Nine. And when I was producing artists, I would go up to Nim Nimbus Nine and, and mix there or work there as well. Yeah. So I love Canadian music. Has time changed, like with the budgets? Because it's like nobody's flying anybody no more. Yeah, I'll tell I'll tell you how, how it's so changed. Um, this last record, uh, this one, The Way of the World, that guy. Um, I recorded that in, in, in my friend's house. We, we, I'd go over to Lawrence Juber who co-produced the record. Lawrence was a guitar player in wings. He, he, he was in wings and Tony Bronigal, uh, the drummer who produced my first album, uh, with this record company, one called fresh bear tracks. And, uh, I'd go to Lawrence's house with a keyboard. I'd sit down. We put a click track on it, put a vocal mic. I'd sing the song that I just wrote, play it to a click track, put it on Pro Tools. Lawrence would send it over to Tony's house. Tony had drums set up in his living room. He'd put it down on, on Pro Tools on his laptop, send it back to Lawrence. Lawrence would put the guitars on it. We'd send it out to somebody's house who's going to play bass or somebody on the road at the time, you know, in the tour bus or in a hotel, <clears throat> he put the bass on it. You know, then we go, okay, it's time to, time to sing this thing. So who's got the best mic? <laughs> and we'd, we'd find that, you know, whoever the, the best quality microphone and I go over there and sing it there. 
and uh, it actually worked out really well. And it was really kind of inexpensive. We we did it on a shoestring budget, and then um, you know then the record company picked it up because they thought it was a really great record. That's incredible. You know when it's like that simple but complex too. Because I mean you got to send some stuff and everybody's got to know how to maneuver the, the equipment with their laptops. But when you can do all that stuff, you're saving a lot of money to. Unbelievable amount of money. Um, yeah. You're not traveling somewhere. You're not being have to be put up in a hotel or a motel or whatever, you know, you can eat at home every night, you know, you can, and you can, and it's really comfortable to do it that way. Mm -hmm. What's really comfortable about it is, you know, although Lawrence would say to me, okay, come over at 1230 or one o'clock and we'll work from like one to four, you know, that, that was the only schedule really. Um, and it was, it was easy to do it that way. I, I, I didn't listen, I've, I've traveled around the world and, and made records with a lot of bands and, and been hired as a, you know, as a, a session musician or as a, you know, a traveling in the, in the band musician to support the record. Um, and it is what it is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's the way, the way that people were making records and touring. Let's say, let's go back like in time and let's say you'd be charting somewhere. How would you ever know you're charting somewhere? Mm. Like, or that, or that, let's say they released a single in that country and, and you're not aware of it. Well, that happened. That happened um, with a song called "Sunshine Hotel." That was um, a song that I that I recorded um, on the Red Hot and Blue album, <clears throat> and um, I remember going in to meet the A and R people, and they wanted to talk about that record because they were getting a lot of nudges, and and kind of people were saying. Rec and radio was saying, "Hey, this is a really good record. We uh, can we can you do a extended version of it, or can you do a uh, you know uh, do something that we can play in a disco or a dance hall or something?" And they went in and made some maxi records of that, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, this thing went to number four worldwide, mm -hmm. and it was only because and we I never knew it, you know. It, they were telling me, "Hey, you got to." What are you doing next week? I said, I don't know. He said, we're, we're, we're sending you to England. We're sending you to Germany, England, Spain, France. You're on all these t TV shows because your record's number four in the world. So, you know, that's that's how you find out. Pretty quick. Really quick. Wow. Um, going back, you know, let's say making promo videos, you got a new promo video too. You know, on YouTube, how's it make? That, that's 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 cheapo cheaper productions. That's like we go into a studio with four cameras, and we say, "Okay, you four guys, capture us." You know, and then Lawrence, who co-produced the record, he went on his you know on his computer and edited it himself. You know, and we we're not out making those monster MTV music videos with all this production shit. We just go in there, we play it, we sing it, we edit it, we send it, we send it out. You, yeah. you can do a lot of stuff yourself today. And then it's um, on YouTube and people can enjoy it. Exactly. Uh, that's <laughs> quite, because that's, that's the new TV stations, you know. YouTube. That is, that, that's the new world, the, the way of the world. That's why this record's called that because it was done with a retro sound in mind with modern instruments and modern technological, you know, abilities. With the new album too, there's some taste of like kind of dance, um, um, upbeat music, blues dance, it seems like. And the second track of the song, like the, the drums, it's like, um, it's very unique, you know, to what it is. It's people are saying that this record is the kind of record that they haven't experienced 
in a long time, but it's really modern. Right. And so I think we we kind of locked into a a real interesting niche and a really cool place to be because I you know, I use the word homage. I I celebrate certain people the way I play. I loved uh Nicky Hopkins, the British keyboard player. I loved Leon Russell. I loved Dr. John. And I loved, you know, people like that. Uh Chuck Laval. And that's the way I play. That is the way I play. Um and people hire me now, you know, I'll play on the records, you know, some some great producers. Like I just did a session with a guy called Jack Douglas. And he was the producer of Cheap Trick, Lou Reed, Aerosmith, John Lennon, on and on and on. And he's got his own record company now. And he says, I got a new artist I really like. I want you to play on it. And I go down there and I say, what do you want me to play? And he says, I want you to play like Nicky Hopkins and Richard T. Bear had a baby. You know, that's that's the way I want you to play. And I said, okay, you know. So that's 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 a great thing, you know, to be so, able to do that. And there's a lot of people that can't do that. So it's um well, there's a lot of people that haven't been brought up the way I was brought up. Now, fortunately, I will say this. See, I was born in New York City, but I was raised in the Caribbean. So okay. I had Puerto Rico, Port au Prince, Haiti, kind of the Bahamas and Miami. So I grew up listening to Cuban, Puerto Rican, Creole, um, prior to prior to reggae, there was a thing called Mento, which was a cross between Calypso and reggae, Mento music. That's the way I grew up. So I have that, all that DNA in me, you know, so that's kind of different, you know, for a vanilla fella. <laughs> to have all that, those genres of music or style. Right. And, <clears throat> and as a kid, I loved the blues. I mean, I would ride my bike to the record store and pick up Muddy Waters okay. and Howlin' Wolf, you know, and 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 the Kings, Freddie King, Albert King, and B.B. King. And in fact, to this day, I play now keyboards with Walter Trout, who's who's carrying that banner. He's a great, great blues player, great blues guitarist and singer. And I love playing the blues, you know, I love that stuff. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm really fortunate in that way. It's like that you're not a guitar player, you're a keyboard player. You know, that's... that's I am a keyboard player. The thing that's interesting to, you know, in, in this genre. And, 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 and people say, <clears throat> you play in different kind of time signatures and, and, and your rhythms and things like that with your songs. And I say, and that's because I started when I was a really young kid as a percussionist, I would bang on things. Right. And then when my parents got a piano, I'd bang the shit out of that piano like a percussion instrument. You know, my right hand would be playing 16ths and my left hand would be playing eights. And, you know, that's the way it was. Tell me, you, you um, worked with Gene Simmons and Peter Chris. What did you work on with them? They, they, um, I met them um, through a guy called Sean Delaney, who saw me play one night, and he 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 really wanted to drag me into the Kiss camp. He says, "I want you to you know work on stuff that we that we're recording and that we we do." One guy he put me together with was was Billy Squire, and they managed him, and th and then some band called Toby Bow. Um, my Angel Baby went to number one, and I recorded that and played keyboards on that in England. And then um, Gene Simmons got a hold of me, and he says, hey, man, you you write really great songs and things, and we need to do another album. Can you ghostwrite with us? And I said, sure, meaning like, you know, I'd give him some ideas, this and that, and, you know, and it would be uh, Kiss songs. So I did some of that, and then he says, you know what, I'm going to go to England, and I want you to play on this record, and what do you think about a band to put together for me? I'm not going to use the Kiss guys, just I want to do a solo album. And I said, well, I've got this kind of like 
New York mafia band. You know, they're all they're all great sessions players. So we all went over on a Concord with him and Cher. We stayed at the Manor, and two weeks later he had his album. You know, we recorded a, a song a day, and then Peter Chris went, "Man, you can't just play with." Gene, you got to play on my record. And I love the way you play piano, especially on ballads. So will you play with me? And I said, sure, I'll play with you. And I played with him. And then Cher said, oh, my God, you know, you were so great on Gene's. Would you write me some songs? And I wrote her a bunch of songs, put a band together with her. And then one thing leads to another. Then Stephen Stills says, hey, I want you to play in my band. And I joined Stephen Stills' band. And I live with him in his up at his house. And we write songs and we, you know, got hammered. And and then I he brought me down to meet the Crosby, Stills and Nash guys. And I meet them. And, I'm, you know, it's like one, th- one door opens, another door opens. And, uh, you know, and I never turned anything down. I never went, no. And the only, you know, because you never know what's going to happen. And <clears throat> I had the I had the fortune to play to work with Stephen on a song called Seven League Boots, which became a song called Southern Cross. And so I was there at the, you know, kind of the initial birth of that with CSNN. And I, you know, fell in love with playing that kind of music. And and I got really lucky with that. And, you know, but they, you know, one thing, as people say, well, it's not just luck. It's, it's you, you bring something to the, you know, to the, yeah, I'm just one of the seasonings in this in the stew, you know. So this um, all started like in '78, basically. Yeah, yeah. and and um, this all happened in you know '78, '79, '80, '81, '82, '83. I hit my bottom. I was doing so many fucking drugs and so much bullshit um, that I went and got sober, got clean and sober. Um, you know, and then cleaned up my act and uh, moved to Europe. And I lived in Hamburg, Paris, Munich, London, Stockholm. And I made records there for the next few years. Came back to the United States, met a girl, fell in love, got married, and took a 25 years hiatus and didn't put another record out. And uh, so when I finally got divorced, had kids, got divorced, and met a new woman um, called Nina. She said, I know who you are because my ex-boyfriend played in a band with you 30 years ago or 25 years ago, and it's time for you to play music again, and I want you to put a band together because I have records that you played on, and I know what you can do, and I want you to, you know, to do it again. At the time, I had a day job. I was selling light bulbs. Wow. And yeah, and uh, door to door, <clears throat> you know, I would go, you know, door to door in the business. Hey, don't you have better things to do to change these light bulbs out all the time? And, you know, I'd sell them light bulbs. And um, Nina nagged me and nagged me and nagged me. And finally I said, okay, I'll put a band together. And I put a band together called T Bear and Route 66. And it was made up of X Wings members, Denny Siwa, Lawrence Juber. And the E Street Horns guys, the guys that played with Springsteen, Mark Pender and La Bamba. And the guy played horn with, um, oh, man, Stevie Ray Vaughan. It was in his band. And, you know, it was a great band made up of Leon Russell members and Joe Cocker members. And we played in L.A. and just killed it. You know, we were killing it. You know, the people that hadn't heard that kind of shit in a long time. And then all of a sudden, I, you know, I got a... I got a idea that I'd make a record and I was playing a session at Robbie Krieger's studio. Robbie came in and he says, Hey man, I haven't seen you in years. What have you been doing? I said, I've been selling light bulbs. He says, no, no, no. You need to make records. Mm-hmm. He says, you can use my studio. And I said, I can't afford your studio. Um, you know, I'm not signed to a label. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, if the studio is not in use, you come in here and you pay the engineer. I'll give you the studio for free. So he said, oh, yeah, but there's one caveat. I said, what's that? Robbie says, I got to play on it. 
<laughs> so, so he said, okay. And, uh, you know, that's how these things happen. And I, for the next two years, I cut 23 tracks in that studio and 21 were originals. And uh, before I could put the record out, Nina, my my wife at the time, that got me back into music, she got diagnosed with stage four cancer and later that year passed away. And she made me promise, never cancel another gig, go out on tour, finish the record, live your best life, fall in love again. And, you know, don't let me down. And I dedicated, you know, Fresh Bear Tracks to her because it's called Fresh because mm -hmm. I hadn't put anything out in years. The last song on it is Nina's song. And um, got signed to a label right away. I mean, it was like all the planets aligned. And then COVID hit. Of course. And so a song that Stephen Stills and I wrote 30 years ago that I found on a cassette tape in my warehouse in a shoebox that I completely forgot about. I went and cut and it's called Give It Up. And Stephen played guitar on it and Walter Trout played guitar on it and they traded licks back and forth. And it went to number one during COVID over in Europe. They hadn't forgot me yet. Mm -hmm. And um, because we couldn't go out and, and support that record during COVID, the record company said, we want another album from you because it got critical acclaim. Fresh Bear Tracks did. So we put out The Way of the World. And that's why I'm here talking to you. Wow. And I thank, and I thank you. <laughs> it's incredible. I mean, a musician of your stature just to stop for 25 years, that should have been tough. You know, it was very tough. But once a year, I played at a thing called the Musician's Picnic. Okay. To keep it going. And the Musician's Picnic was a clean and sober celebration, okay? And it raised money to put musicians that had no insurance into detox, halfway houses, sober living, um, you know, to clean up their act and help them get started again and play music again. And we took some guys that were, in, and, and women, that, that really needed the help. And we, uh, you know, got them help. So it was called the Musicians Assistance Program, MAP. And I was on the board of directors on that for many years and did the picnic for 20-something years. And um, MAP is now called Music Cares. It's an arm of the Grammys. It's their charitable or arm. So I feel, you know, really good about ha having done that. It's, it's, it's really good karma. And every year we'd play this musician's picnic and I'd put a band together, you know, and I, we had a kind of a super session band and people would show up to play. And we had people play like Eric Clapton would show up and play and um, Matt and Duff from Guns N' Roses and Anthony Kiedis from the Chili Peppers and Chicago and, and a million people that you know of. Um, and we'd play this, this little uh, this little musicians picnic to raise money, you know, to help musicians. Incredible picnic in a park, basically. We would rent a uh, a park, well, well, kind of a place that had weddings and things like that that could yeah. hold anywhere from one to five thousand people, and we never advertised it. It was word of mouth, and one guy would say, "Hey, the musicians picnic is August," you know. 26th at Calamigas Ranch in Malibu. And we'd rent a ranch, you know, and we'd put a stage out there and wow. people would come and we'd have like the akin to like barbecue and food trucks and a jumping things for the kids and face painting. And it was a family. It was a family deal. Still goes on. We Walter Trout and I played it this year oh. in in Topanga Canyon. <laughs> Incredible. It's yeah. Like Word of mouth, yeah, and, and look, by the way, Eric Clapton's coming. Oh yeah, that that that, that kind of helps bring people. That, you know, normally what we say is we can't tell you who's going to be there. Okay. Yeah, 
because, you know, we're kind of sworn to secrecy. But that got out and it was 6,000 people that showed up. I'm sure. Richard, yeah. to finish off uh, just quickly, um, um, let's say back on the Gene Simmons and Peter Chris, you're basically playing all the piano parts on those two solo albums, basically. Correct. Correct. That is incredible. I've been listening to them all my life without knowing this. So living in sin, you know, and all that stuff. Absolutely. Incredible. And now you got a new album and we're finally, you know, di- rediscovering you. Yeah. At least, you know, in Nova Scotia, it's, it's hard, you know, for um, people to come in and, and, you know, play these places too sometimes. You know what I, the way I feel right now, and this is, this is really the, the God's honest truth. I'm not making this up. You know, I make, I make this, I make records or I make my records um, with, with, and this is my goal. Okay. It's to be authentic, genuine, and honest. Okay. And not to follow somebody's trend or anything like this. And, when I start to sing and do my vocals or whatever, I I imagine that I'm singing to you. I see you, I, or I see a face, and I'm not I'm not singing to the masses. I'm not singing to the millions. I'm singing to one person at a time, because I want to have a relationship with these records to people that have a relationship to music. People that love music, that when times are tough, they put on the music. When they're stuck in traffic, they put on the music. When they get home and are cooking, they put on the music. Yeah. You know, that's it. That's it. I'm not, hey, you know what? I don't, 100 million people are not going to buy my record. If I can get a half a percent or 1% of those people that have a relationship with music to buy the record or download the record, I'm going to be really happy. I mean, I had a therapist contact me very recently and she said, you know what? There's a song on this album and it's called breathe. And she said, I listened to that and it's therapy. As a matter of fact, I'm going to change that word therapy to therapy. <laughs> therapy. She said, I'm going to use your name, not therapy, therapy. <laughs> and I said, okay, okay. She goes, because you made me feel like I can get through something. You're talking to me. I can hear you talking to me. I feel you, you know, singing to me. And those are the, and that's really important. That's the most important thing. Not many people mentioned that, like, just the way you said it. So, yeah, it's pretty, pretty awesome and solid. And it's like that, Richard. I appreciate you taking the time today to promote your album. And it's um, it's, it's a great product in the, the sonic waves of it. Very sounds good in the ears. Oh, it sounds really good. I mean, um, you know, there's the the um, I'm proud of a couple of things on this record. One one thing is it, it's a bonus track called Red Harvest. Um, do you have time to talk to you about that for a second? Yeah. So the interview is going to end maybe in one minute. Red Harvest is 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 uh, a duet with Paul Rogers from Bad Company. Right. And uh, I'm really proud of him showing up and and wanting to do that with me. So I, uh, you know, and it's. And the and the proceeds of that go to the Ukrainian Red Cross and the and the World Kitchen. Wow! Keep up the great work, and um, hopefully, you got a lot of shows this year, and you keep busy just like you did back in 1978, 79. Absolutely, man! I hope I'm in. I hope I'm in your area so I can hang with you. That'd be awesome. It's like um, just keep on the great work. That's all I can say. Because uh, your product, I, awesome. I sure will. I'll, um. And when we when we stop recording, I'll give you a way to contact me. So if I'm ever in your area, we can we can hang out. 